Coming up on DTNS, Panasonic has a VR headset you might not mind being seen wearing. Facebook gives you more control over the ads you see, and Verizon swears off bundling TV, internet, and phone. Do we believe them? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, January 9th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. Oakland, California. I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were uh, just having a conversation about uh, back pain <laughs> and yes. birds and uh, and uh, traveling to CES. Uh, if you want to get that conversation, become a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Mozilla updated Firefox to patch an actively exploited critical zero-day vulnerability. Researchers at China's Chihu 360 reported the flaw. It's a form of type confusion that causes data to be written to or read from memory locations that should be off limits. This can bypass address space layout randomization, or ASLR, and lead to control of an affected system by somebody who shouldn't have control of that system, and also possibly just cause crashes, which is annoying. The flaw is fixed in Firefox 72.01.1, which you can get right now. So, no joke, users of Firefox should update immediately. This is a critical zero-day vulnerability being exploited. Get the patch now. Microsoft released a new tool in collaboration with the Meat Group, Roblox, Kick, and Thorn, codenamed Project Artemis, that scans online chats and pinpoints conversations that may involve exploitation of children. It's built off a Microsoft patent available to third party and uses historical chat data to assign probability ratings to chats. Companies can then use that rating to determine whether a human moderator should step in to review. Uh, Lime scooters. They, they, a lot of people see them as leading the revolution in these rental scooters. Uh, Lime tells Axios it's laying off about 14% of its workforce. That's about 100 employees and shutting down operations in 12 markets. Lime suspended operations, laid off workers in St. Louis in late 2018, but the company says it does plan to expand to new markets this year. Uh, and uh, there's lots of other scooter operators like Bird and, and, and such out there. So uh, just just uh, we've reached that point in the scooter market, I guess, Justin. Uh, All right. Tell us about uh, this weird thing that Panasonic has at CES. Oh, Tom, the prototypes, they're not done yet at a CES. Panasonic is showing off a virtual or a concept virtual reality headset that looks like goggles and hopes to feel like wearing eyeglasses. It has a lightweight body, uh, so it does not include a headband and uses a micro OLED panel that supports UHD, HDR. The Verge tried it and said it didn't feel stable when you tilted your head forward, and the image is a small square with a more limited field of view than current VR headsets usually have. Panasonic is aiming the development of the, of the glasses at the commercial, not consumer market. Think arcades more than home use. Yeah, maybe theme parks, stuff like that. Uh, and the Verge said it didn't have the screen door effect. That the uh, the high resolution of the of the panels did make the the image look really good. Uh, so there's some ways you could get around that smaller field of view. Maybe they'll be able to increase it. This is obviously a prototype. Uh, maybe they'll fix that thing where it shifts forward on your head. But that that's an eyeglasses thing, right? Yeah. When you don't have a strap around the back. Glasses can tend to move down your nose, so uh, you you know you trade in a little bit of of uh, functionality for prettier form. I think. I would suspect also if this is something that arcades or theme parks would use, you'd probably throw a a a thing on the back just to make sure that probably, yeah. stuff doesn't fall off your head. <sighs> you know, it's an interesting prototype. It's something that I think would probably be better used for augmented reality if it did have a pass through, even if you mm -hmm. had something on it. But um, I, I don't know. A anything that is a smaller field of vision, even if it's crisper, to me, is a non-starter. Uh, immersiveness is the key. Yeah, and 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 I, I I hesitate to criticize this for that too much at this point because they really are trying to show off the form factor more than the functionality, and I get that this is this is a prototype. Uh, they're saying, look, we can we can make something that works that doesn't look like you're wearing a ski mask, uh, and I think that that's the that's the point to look to look at here. I mean, it's the maturing of this market, and like you say, 
mixed reality is what everybody is pointing to now. They're like, you know what? Let's not choose. Let's not choose between virtual reality, augmented reality, or reality. Let's just have have devices that can do all of that uh, for us. And and this certainly would be a slightly more acceptable to way to walk around than, of course, having a, a fully enclosed visor uh, if you had proper pass through. So I, I do think this is a good sign that that we're we're finally getting to the point where people are just experimenting with the form factor rather than, you know, several years ago at CES, Oculus was showing off something with duct tape on, on it just to say, like, look, we can do it. That virtual reality thing you've been hearing about for decades, we actually can do. Uh, we're at the point where we're, we're trying to make it look pretty now, which I think is progress. I don't want to crap on it because I have not experienced it. And 99% of these, uh, of this kind of technology to me, you know it when you see it, literally. Uh, that being said, this feels to me like they're trying to solve a problem form factor before we have done enough to entice people to want to get in to these worlds. The Oculus Quest to me is the leader in the clubhouse in terms of uh, giving you an immersive free walking experience if it is something that has that technology that has a smaller slimmer form factor now i'm excited but but in, in, until we can demonstrate that who knows uh, uh that being said as far as a a canvas to paint on for larger like theme parks and arcades that seems reasonable yeah, you're going from a ridiculous box on your face to steampunk goggles. Right? Yes. Yeah, not bad. Uh, data from the China Academy of Information and Communications Technology, uh, this is a government agency in China, says Apple shipped 3.2 million iPhones in China in December, up 18% from the 2.7 million it shipped last December 2018. Uh, this is good news for Apple because back in November, CounterPoint reported Apple's share of the smartphone market in China had fallen from 9% to 8%. Uh, not a huge fall, but not the direction you want to be going. And there were worries that uh, with the restrictions on Huawei from the United States government that maybe uh, a backlash in China might hurt Apple. Uh, and it sounds like they, Apple seems to have recovered, especially because this is coming from a government number, which really has no motivation to skew the number in Apple's favor, uh, one wouldn't yeah. think. Anything's possible, I suppose, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I hesitate to try and square these numbers together to say that, like, okay, well, they might have fallen to 8%, but there's so many more people that are constantly looking to buy smartphones uh, in, in China that maybe an 18% uptick uh, uh, could, could be feasible beyond that uh i don't know if i'm going to read the tea leaves uh you know we do have a phase one china deal signing on the horizon between the united states and and china and maybe part of this is is a good faith uh a gesture to say hey look we're not impeding apple's progress in china we're like they're doing great 18 percent good for you yeah i suppose so also i i don't think a, a rise in sales in December on its own is surprising. You have Singles Day, November 11th, uh, so so that starts getting people interested in buying things. Uh, China does does have a strong December buying season like the rest of the world, and uh, and so you would expect it to be higher. I think people were were worried that it was uh, not going to be. Uh, higher because because it was just going to keep pushing Apple in the wrong direction and and so the news isn't like iPhone sales surging in China it's like no iPhone sales behaving as you would have otherwise expected yeah. them to if you weren't worried about anything uh, hey I think uh, we we had some technical difficulties but Sarah Lane uh, has finally been able to join us uh, on the show hey Sarah hello fam wow that was a fun software update <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, software updates. Uh, if you're, if folks out there feel bad uh, about them, they they can happen to anybody at the worst time. So oh, they really can. Yeah. So sorry about that, but uh, glad to be here. Hi, Justin. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Oh, I I I I've never been better. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. You know that Thursday rush. What a rush it is. <laughs> better than All the right. energy drink. You are uh, just in time for Facebook news, aren't you? Aren't you glad? I really am. What What's up? Facebook and Instagram will offer users an option to see fewer political and social issue ads. Uh, this is kind of a vague announcement. It's coming to the United States sometime this summer, and it'll be a setting that 
says, I don't want to see as many. You can't turn them off, uh, but I guess you can reduce them. More details will probably come later this summer when they launch the feature. Later this month, people will get the option to not just block all ads from any advertiser. This isn't political. This is any ad, political or not. Uh, but elect, or I'm sorry, select the option not to be targeted by email address or phone number. This is something that Facebook calls custom audiences from a list. In other words, you can say, I don't mind seeing an ad from McDonald's as long as it's not being shown to me specifically because they know my email address and phone number. Uh, it's a way to say, don't target me. I'll watch the ads that run for everyone, but I don't want to see an ad just because they know it's me. So you'll be able to turn that off. I think that's very interesting. Even more interesting, you'll be able to reverse that and unblock yourself from seeing a company's ad. Sometimes a company says, oh, don't, sh we have this list of customers' phone numbers and email addresses. Don't show that customer our ad because we don't think it's effective for them. Political candidates often do this to stop paying for ads to appear to people that they don't believe are ever gonna donate, so why, why waste their time and money on it? Uh, you'll be able to take yourself, put yourself back on those lists uh, with this feature. That's coming later this month. I think that one's really fascinating. Uh, and then coming sometime this quarter is a new feature in the ad library that'll just, this is part of transparency. They're gonna add the ability for you to see how many people a political advertiser is attempting to reach, uh, which is, is especially good for researchers who are trying to figure out who's advertising to whom, probably more so than than your average viewer. So uh, good, good transparency coming there. Uh, what do you think of this, Justin? Well, you know, there's 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 a lot to kind of parse through. Uh, my expertise, obviously, would be on the political side, wherein right now, if you are in Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, or South Carolina, you are seeing a tremendous ad spend, specifically from two candidates, Tom Steyer and Michael Bloomberg, who are spending unprecedented amounts of money at this stage for various different reasons. The latest was over 200 million combined between the two of them. But by the time that this stuff comes around, we're going to be talking to DTNS listeners in Ohio, Florida, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, very key battleground states that anybody in those states, specifically Iowa, Pennsylvania, and Florida know very well are saturated, carpet bombed, with political advertising that I think for them being able to say, we get it. I know who I'm voting for. I don't need to see any more ads. That's good both for the prospective voter and to be honest, the person who is buying the ads. The idea of loosening some of the controls based on phone number and email, which are often the most reliable, valuable uh, sets of data for political uh, campaigns, uh, to give you an example, Brad Parscale is the man who is running Donald Trump's campaign now. If you want to go to a Donald Trump rally, and again, these things are held in arenas and they pack them out, you need to give your email and your phone number uh, as well as fill out some demographic data so they know how to contact you. This is uh, a, not a revolutionary idea in terms of harvesting that spe those specific data points, but making them less valuable is I think Facebook's way and a, a, a not unintelligent way of them saying, look, we're going to make this less targeted. Or we're gonna give you the ability to right. not be targeted if you don't want. And that is a very interesting- uh, It's uh, interesting yeah. and it, at the same time, it feels very convoluted to me. It's not as if Facebook was like, you know what? This is just too much. We're not gonna do this. That's not in Facebook's uh, business interests. But um, the 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 variety of settings that are offered to the public now, and I think that they're in good faith. These are all settings that if you understand those settings, you go, okay, I, I actually have more of uh, I have more power to make Facebook my own experience depending on you know how I want to use it. That's all fine and good. The messaging to the greater public of Facebook, that's the that's the part that gets uh, uh, challenging. Yeah. And, and and as I said, so, some of this is only going to be useful for for people who are doing research uh, and, and trying to uncover things. And that's good. It's good to have transparency, even if only a few people use it, because then they can tell the rest of us what's going on. Uh, but these kind of controls over the custom audience from a list as fascinating as they are to me, Sarah, I think you're right most people aren't going to want to dig in and figure all of that stuff out, are they? Uh, but but I, I, I would agree with both of you. 
I would only add this one little bit of color to the idea that it is against their business interest. Uh, I also think it is the most Facebook version of this solution where they're <laughs> like, well, obviously, you know, it's very engineered, right? Exactly. Right. Okay. We're going to we're going to offer you 10 more options. Aren't you happy? <laughs> exactly. Because to them, to the engineers, a problem is when I don't have a, a switch to flip. They're right. giving a switch to flip. What more do you mouth breathers want? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, Verizon Fios announced that it will no longer offer bundles of internet and TV services and will no longer require contracts uh, uh, contracts to purchase its service. Instead, Fios will offer three internet levels from $40 to $80 a month with speeds of 100 uh, of, uh, megabytes to gigabit. Uh, separately, TV packages will run from $50 to $90 a month, depending on the channels. You can get from YouTube TV for $50 a month. Verizon says that there will be no additional fees, only taxes, and you can add home phone for $20 a month and 24-7 support for $15 a month. Oh, that's expensive support. Well, <laughs> you get, still get support during business hours, but this is like, hey, you want to be able to call us anytime. Right, 15 right, bucks yeah. a month. Yeah. <laughs> For uh, all your internet troubles we're giving you. Yeah, it feels more like a business offering to me, but I guess maybe they'll get some some consumers to, to pay for it. I don't, I don't know. Um, this, is, this is Verizon firing the first shot in the unbundling wars and saying, you know what? We'll be the first to try it. No ISP wants to try unbundling because the theory has been when you bundle it together, you get people in the tent at a reduced price. And then after their year contract is up, the price goes up and no one bothers to call, at least that, very few. Yeah, we know right. you out there bothered to call, but nobody else did. Right. Uh, that's and that's why what makes people that profitable. who have the internet and TV bundles actually have cheaper bundles in the beginning than those of us who were like, I don't want TV. I just want internet. Yeah. You but know, they, and the company says, stop. but don't, but, but, but you'll get TV for a reduced rate. And I'm like, nah, not for long, not for long. Yeah. Because it ends up, if you don't, if you're not, you know, vigilant, uh, it ends up costing people more. And the average cable, uh, TV internet bill is ridiculously high. We've talked about that before on the show. So this is Verizon's way, not so much of even saying you could save you money. Although there's an Ars Technica article out today. I think it's one of their writers in Massachusetts tried to get this new bundle as an existing customer because he's like, I'll save money. Like mm -hmm. getting the but getting the individual packages from them will be less than the bundle I have now. I would like to do that. Uh, he couldn't get customer service to figure out how to make the software give him the new offering. I have a feeling that has more to do than with the fact that it's the first day and Verizon just doesn't have their stuff together uh, for this offer yet. But uh, but it would be, have been cheaper for him to do this new one. More, more than that, though, I, I think it's just about clarity, saying like, all right, we're not going to make you try to figure out, okay, well, I remember to call in and keep the, the trial price or talk them into keeping the trial price. Uh, will, will I, will I, can I compare apples and oranges if I switch? They're saying, look, what you pay is what you get. No hidden fees is a big part of this. We're not going to give you a local sports fee. We're not going to give you a rental fee. It's just you pay for the service and the tax. The tax is on top of this. So that's just yeah. generally the way it works for anything in the United States. Well, and as you mentioned, Justin, YouTube TV, 50 bucks a month. I pay for that. Um, if Verizon can it can somewhat match that, okay, I pay Verizon somewhere between 50 and 100 bucks a month for whatever internet is right for me. You know, you can go a little higher if you want something crazy. but And then you're somewhere in that $50 range for television as well. Well, Verizon's like, okay, well, we've got a lot of competition. People are sort of branching off into other uh, options. For those people who go, well, let's just do it all in one place, this this seems smart to me. It is It is good. It also represents two things uh, very quickly. Number one, there is uh, a, a now concerted effort from Verizon, I would expect from the other telecoms, to try to get themselves out of the basement of the worst company of the year awards, for which mm. they are really uh, uh, residents of. And two, it is a sign that their worst fears were not realized. But five, ten years ago, the worry was with the rise of YouTube that there would be a tremendous amount of user-generated content for which would totally kill cable. That that all these I all these shows and stuff that people love will now just fall out of favor. And while that might be on the horizon at some point in the year of our Lord 2020, we still like watching Bravo. We still like watching ESPN. We still want these channels. And Verizon wants to sell them to you. And I think it's a smart move to do it at a non-crazy inflated price. 
Going across the pond, across the Atlantic, a new menu of default search engines is coming to the setup process for Android smartphones in Europe. The three alternatives to Google on the menu were determined by a bidding process. DuckDuckGo and Info.com will appear on the menu in all 31 European markets. Bing will appear on the menu only in the UK. Sesnum, Yandex, and Awant will be options. Quant. It's a Q, quant. Oh, qu quant. <laughs> Sorry, so I don't know. Uh, will be options in some markets as well. Yeah, so uh, this this is, of course, raising a lot of opposition of like the fact that Google allowed people to have bidding to get on this ballot. Uh, but we knew that was coming. We knew it was going to be bidding, and we knew people would object to that. It is interesting to see DuckDuckGo splash out for this, uh, and, and, and they are sort of the darling of, of privacy advocates. Uh, and these regional ones, like the, I think it's Czech, uh, the Shezhnam and Russian is Yandex. Uh, this is in Europe. This is in the European Union. Uh, and Quant is French. Uh, so kind of a regionalism to search engines is, is a little bit fascinating to see. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if bidding is the best way to get people the best search results. Uh, but obviously, Google has to make a uh, make a show of the fact that they are not totally dominating <laughs> search on their Android phones. And so here we are. I, I hope that all the regulators are pleased. Well, the, the bidding was was Google saying like, look, fine, we'll open it up, but this is a very valuable relationship. We should be allowed to put a price on it uh, because if we're not going to get the money that we would get from people using our search engine for this yeah. free operating system, we need to get that money somewhere. That's Google's argument here. Uh, I wonder if, just like the browser ballot for Windows, uh, this will just end up with most, most people picking Google because that's what they're familiar with. Yeah, I mean, I would assume so. And also, yeah, yeah, they're I, I, it's, leader for a reason. Exactly. Um, it's good to have options. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the opening up of, hey, you've got some options for browsers. Google can't just say, it's Google. You can choose Google if you want. I mean, that's the one that I choose, but it is nice to have options. Warner Brothers Pictures says it will use a project management system from Cinelytic, uh, which is a, a company targeting motion picture companies and, and production companies uh, to help make decisions about which movies to green light. This doesn't mean that an AI will be picking what movies go into theaters. What it means is that the Synalytic machine learning algorithms will be used by Warner Brothers to project revenue, uh, weight the value of the names associated with the project, and recommend the optimum premiere date, something they used to have associate producers do uh, and spend a lot of time on. And now they can free them up uh, to do other things because they got the software to do it for them. So you say that this will not be choosing which movies will go in theaters, but these are all the decisions that go into choosing which movies go in theaters, right? Well, well they are, they I mean, it's hard. a whittling it's a whittling down of, you know, some movies that are never going to make it into theaters. It's the equivalent of, you know, you, Justin, someone saying, read these 30 scripts over the weekend and tell me which five oh, are okay, like okay, maybe okay. worth my time. All right. So then let's let's remove the semantic crutch that no, a computer is not just going to say this now goes here. The computer will give a report card. It's more weeding out the stuff that just can't work. Think, think of think of the think of this scenario, right? Uh, uh, Jeff Warner is sitting there in his Warner Brothers office, uh, <laughs> deciding what movies go where, and he's like, "How much revenue do we expect this to make?" Uh, Pam, AP. Uh, and and by the way, I, I see Scarlett Johansson is on here. Just how much is she worth these days? Also, I want to know when the, that we think this should premiere before I make a decision about all these movies. Instead of Pam coming in and telling him, he's got a printout from the software. Sure, Pam Hansen. Well, yeah, and then you like factor in actor schedules, uh, award season, yeah, uh, all of that summer stuff. blockbuster stuff. Look. I mean, when you really kind of get down to it. This is pretty genius, even though, yes, there has to be a, a human involved uh, and, and many involved in the creative process. But just to kind of get to the point where it's like, this might be worth your attention for these reasons. This might be a hit. Take a look. It's not genius. It, it is. It is something. <laughs> it is something that we we would be applauding people that they're using Microsoft Word. Like at the very least. <laughs> 
it is something that that will, <laughs> sure do that's a, that, that will do a job that they should be doing in a quantifiable way that they can use data points to make decisions. But the only reason why we are talking about this right now is they decided to make a press release out of it. And the only reason they decided to make a press release out of it is because of Netflix. Netflix has famously, from the moment they bought their first uh, independent show, House of Cards, why did they do that? Because they noticed that Kevin Spacey movies got replayed. They noticed that dark dramas got replayed. They noticed that David Fincher movies got replayed. So what do they want to do? They wanted to put together all these all these elements together in a show. It was a massive hit for them. The only reason we are talking about this is because Warner Brothers wants to raise their hand and says, we do data too. And I have no idea what it gets them. They might as well be walking around with their hands outstretched going beep, bop, boop, where computer people <laughs> Uh, I I think you're absolutely right. Like this is a this is a kind of story, which is like, oh, we're moving on from from making some of these decisions by hand, but to having machine learning, because in some ways this is a positive machine learning story, which is machine learning isn't just a bunch of bogus crap. It can actually do decent projections uh, that we used to have to do by hand. And yeah, it won't be perfect, but neither was the way we did it by hand. So here's an example of machine learning providing a valuable service to make Pam's job easier as an associate producer. But instead, we're getting a press release, like you say, that's like, we're using AI to help us pick movies, yeah, and, uh, and which is is like saying like, hey, instead of having the typing pool uh, make the scripts, we're using computers to make the scripts. In other words, they bought printers. Exactly. And, and one last thing here, no matter what comes out on that printout, the person who's the head of whatever uh, a division, if not the network, the, the, the studio itself, they're going to be making the final call. Because guess what? The computer's not going to get fired if the movie bombs. The studio head's going to get Oh, fired. yeah, no. And Warner Brothers is very clear. I, I want to be fair to Warner Brothers. They were very clear that we're like, we're not saying this computer program's making the final call. We're just saying we're using it to assist in that. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. And thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Submit stories and vote on other stories that you care about and you want us to care about as well. DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com. Also, join in the conversation in our Discord. You can join by linking to a Patreon account at Patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's see what's in the mailbox. Oh, let's. Scott wrote in about our IoT conversation at CES yesterday with Bill Detweiler and Shannon Morse and the push for a new bridge solution. We saw a lot of that at the show this year. Scott says, a hub is a critical component that provides a bridge between wireless technologies suitable for things with wall power or the ability to be frequently recharged and things that must operate for months off a battery charge. Without a hub, one has to rely on Wi-Fi IoT devices and Wi-Fi is just too much of a battery hog for a positive IoT experience. Scott says, there's Bluetooth, but Bluetooth itself requires a hub. And it's inferior to Zigbee and Z-Wave for IoT purposes. What is so bad about a tiny little puck that plugs into your router, especially considering all the benefits it enables? Scott says, I use a Samsung SmartThings bridge uh, with the one app that I can connect to and control my video doorbell, my other cameras, my thermostat, and my 40-something-odd battery-powered sensors throughout my home. I checked out Wise Cams, but to this day, they don't interface with SmartThings, making them as a DOA solution for me. It seems fewer and fewer things support smart things and work solely with the voice assistants. Those devices will never be put in my home. So to this day, all those smart homes that require voice assistants uh, are the day that I get out of IoT. Yeah, so uh, Scott is very passionate about hubs. Uh, and uh, the one thing I will point out is that some hubs use Wi-Fi. Uh, I use Wi-Fi enabled devices without a hub and their battery runs sometimes. You can also have Wi-Fi enabled devices that are wired. Uh, so, I, and you know, I change the battery, I don't know, once a year, maybe over a five year period, I might end up changing the battery six times. Uh, but it, uh, you know, it's it's doable, but it's, it's getting better. Uh, but Scott's right, uh, for, for battery life, the hub system is better, and certainly the wired system is, is even uh, better than, than that. Uh, but the hub system, if you're using Zigbee or Z-Wave, not Wi-Fi, uh, is a little better on your battery life. So, so Scott, speaking up for hubs, 
Uh, I had a, an email exchange with Scott about this, and I pointed out sadly that the world seems to be against Scott because the world seems to not want the hub. He's like, but but a hub. He's like, because I'm like, look, people see it as easier if you don't have to use a hub. And he's like, but a hub makes things easier. It's it's harder to configure Wi-Fi for a thing. And I'm like, hey, I'm not. You're not wrong, Scott. Uh, but uh, at least Scott fights for the hubs in this this increasingly hubless. And if world. not for Scott, Scott, who would? Exactly. Exactly. Hey, shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Rushon Brantley, Adam Carr, and Bjorn Andre. And also thanks to Justin Robert Young. Sorry, guys, I missed half the show. I'm sure it was just <laughs> amazing as usual. Justin, where can people keep up with what you've been doing up uh, these days? Well, of course, you can always follow me, Justin R. Young, on Twitter. But really the big thing is, guys, if you've been waiting to... <laughs> To listen to Raise the Dead, my historical podcast, named best podcast, one of the best podcasts of 2019, by a uh, 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 podcastmaniac.com, uh, then now's the time because the finale is out. And uh, uh, if you uh, want to listen to all six episodes, one after another after another, you don't got to wait any more time. It is there for you right now. Raise the Dead podcast. Dot com get the entire first season in your life as soon as you can uh, uh I'm, I'm very very proud of it and thank you to all the dtns listeners that have already listened to it and and said really nice things if you haven't man what are you waiting for yeah you will be smarter after you listen to this podcast. Go check it out. Uh, we also have new Patreon rewards uh, to celebrate six years of DTNS. Len Peralta created a six-year anniversary DTNS logo. And if you back us at certain levels at patreon.com slash DTNS for three months, you get a sticker or a poster or a mug or a T-shirt with that logo on it. Get the details at patreon.com slash DTNS slash merch. Do it now. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Write us early and often. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Lamar Wilson and Len Peralta. will be here to illustrate. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>